The war of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 leaves lots of unanswered questions. Even though we did two previous videos on this topic, we didn't answer one of the most puzzling ones. We've left it for this video. Why aren't any of Israel's closest neighbors involved in Gog and Magog? Why aren't they in the list of nations? Scholars like Bill Salis and Joel Richardson have given guesses, but this video presents an entirely new biblical theory based on the shoulders of their work, one that resolves all the questions. In order to understand this aspect of Gog and Magog, one needs to have a good grasp of Psalm 83, a prophetic psalm written by Asaph the seer, who was a member of King David's court 3,000 years ago. In our last episode, our top 30 rated YouTube community discussed Psalm 83 in the video and comments section. We debated who the participants of the war will be, and then we made an amazing discovery. Psalm 83 is not about a single war, but about multiple wars, signified by the three groups of wicked military leaders who attacked Israel and were referenced in the psalm. These leaders were from three separate battles during the time of the judges. So we came to the conclusion that Psalm 83 is about more than one war. If you haven't watched that foundational video, click on the banner when it appears to watch it first, then come back to this one to finish up. But if you've already seen the video, you know we suggest there might be a fourth battle in this ongoing struggle. In this video, we're going to look at all of them, the three historic wars and the fourth which is to come. So let's first look at the main theories that currently exist about Psalm 83. The first theory is that this psalm prophesies the 1948 Israeli War for Independence. In that war, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Gaza, and Iraq all attacked the newly formed state of Israel. These are exactly the nations listed in Psalm 83. And interestingly, the King of Jordan, who led what is sometimes called the Children of Lot, led the united effort against Israel just as Psalm 83 predicted. So from that aspect, the aspect of the nations involved, Psalm 83 is an exact match with the Israeli war for independence. However, the repercussions on the nations that follow don't match. Now Psalm 83 continues beyond the references to those three previous wars, the, the sets of leaders that we talked about, to a fourth reference. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, like fire that burns the forest and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. Fill their faces with dishonor that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and dismayed forever and let them be humiliated and perish. Obviously, God did not pursue them with his tempest, nor did he dismay them forever or destroy them. The war for independence, then, isn't a perfect match on its own. So the first theory, the theory that Psalm 83 is about the 1948 war for independence only, matches the nations, but does not match the fate of the aggressor nations. Let's look at the second theory, Bill Salas's theory about Psalm 83. His theory is that these same combined Muslim forces will once again invade Israel, but God will supernaturally empower the Israeli defense forces who will completely destroy these nations and Israel will expand its borders, overtake the land possessed by these other nations and all of this prior to the tribulation period. I have a couple problems with this theory as a standalone theory. 
First, although Salus doesn't use this term, other scholars who agree with him call this the war of extermination, the extermination of the Arab peoples. Let's see why this is incorrect. The Bible does refer to the judgment of all these nations, even the complete extermination of one, Edom. But Israel isn't the one doing the judging. It's God and God alone. Let's look at a passage about Edom's judgment. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. Isaiah 63, 1-3 So Jesus is clear that Edom will be judged, but it is Jesus and Jesus alone who does the judging. Jesus was specific that no man was with me. Moab is seen to be judged in Numbers 24, Isaiah 25, and Amos 2. And in Zephaniah 2, Gaza, Moab, Assyria, and Ammon are all judged and destroyed, but by the Lord himself. In Joel 3, Lebanon is destroyed, and in Ezekiel 30, we see Arabia destroyed by the Lord. All these righteous judgments belong to Jesus and Jesus alone. Nowhere in these passages, or in Psalm 83 for that matter, is Israel the agent of the destruction. This places the timing of the judgment at the return of Christ. An important point we're going to return to in just a minute. And frankly, promoting this theory sets up Israel as some kind of genocidal maniacs destroying all these people of these nations without a single word from the Lord authorizing them to do it. This is a serious problem that Christians have if they endorse it. The death toll from this war of extermination, as some scholars like to call it, would be equal to 30 holocausts combined. A second problem associated with this theory is the vast expansion of Israel prior to the beginning of the 70th week. Salus estimates it will increase the size of Israel 13 times after the Israeli victory, which he envisions, and will achieve the borders God assigned in Genesis from the Nile to the Euphrates. However, this land is promised to Jesus, to Jesus to distribute as he wishes. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. Galatians 3.16. So this is an extremely premature proposed expansion into the land, in my opinion. One without biblical backing and one that, if wrong, will mislead the church to watch for something that just won't happen. Now those are the problems with the theory, but there is one very strong observation that Salus made that I think we need to consider. And that is that Psalm 83 deals with an inner circle of countries that share common borders with Israel and that have espoused an eternal hatred for Israel. Lebanon, Gaza, Syria, Jordan, and the Palestinians plus the Arabian Arabs and probably some Egyptian Arabs. But in Ezekiel 38, the prophet lists an entirely different group. They're an outer ring of countries. None of them share a common border with Israel. You're dealing with Turkey, Iran, Libya, Sudan, maybe some of the breakaway republics of the Soviet Union, but they were never Israel's historic enemies. And yet, not one of the Psalm 83 nations is included in the Gog Magog war found in Ezekiel. Salus doesn't believe this is accidental and neither do I. It is beyond what I think is reasonable to think the prophet Ezekiel chose not to list any of these inner ring nations which are blue by name 
without a reason for not listing them. I think this evidence makes it overwhelmingly clear, at least to me, that there are two waves to this war. Just look at this map. Look how exclusionary the two groups of nations are. One inner group and one outer group. This is not random chance. And this eliminates the possibility in my mind that Jesus destroys both groups at one time on the day of the Lord. We know Jesus destroys both groups, but in my opinion, it is at different times, which I'm sure is confusing to you right now, but I'm going to help you explore how that can be in just a moment. But for right now, I think you can see that the Bible listing out two groups of nations pretty much limits the possibility that Psalm 83 relates solely to Armageddon and to the destruction of all of them on one day. <laughs> so now we've eliminated every known theory. Let's look at an idea no one has looked at before, to the best of our knowledge anyway, one that answers every question but which has been ignored because it involves a slightly different understanding of the end times than 99% of scholars have perceived. But when you view the end times from this view, this very biblical perspective, Psalm 83 and Gog and Magog, they just fall into perfect alignment. This new theory is that Psalm 83 encompasses the entire period of time from Israel's reformation as a nation in 1948 and its war of independence through the wars of 67 and 73 all the way to the return of Jesus. That is a nearly complete picture of the ongoing and continuous struggle between Israel and the nations surrounding it and their attempts to destroy Israel. That this isn't a one-time battle or even one war but what is now an over 70 year campaign by these nations. And that is why in Psalm 83 verses nine through 12, Asap is inspired to recount three separate enemy commander teams in the struggles between Israel and the nations round about who want to destroy her in the days of the judges. Psalm 83 isn't going to be like one of these ancient wars, but like several, because Psalm 83 isn't a single war either. So three conflicts took place, all of which Israel was greatly outnumbered in, and each time Israel won by the grace and assistance of God. I see this as possibly vaguely parable to the three wars of 1948, 67, and 73, but at a minimum, there were multiple conflicts, all won by human leaders. Then we see a fourth triumph in Psalm 83, but this one is not by human hands. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like chaff before the wind, like fire that burns the forest, and like a flame that sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your storm. It appears the next conflict will be one which the Lord destroys these nations as he has promised, but by his own hand and by fire and brimstone. Okay, now let's try to solve the mystery of why there are different nations in Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 and 39, the Gog-Magog War. In order to do that, one must first understand that the Gog-Magog battle concludes with Armageddon. It is not pre-trib or mid-trib. In this previous video, we present pretty conclusive evidence that this is so. If you haven't seen this video, click on the banner when it appears to watch it now. Because if you are still thinking Gog-Magog is a pre-trib or mid-trib battle, you will not understand the beauty of solving this mystery. Okay, now I'm assuming everyone is on board with the Gog-Magog battle concluding with Armageddon. When Jesus is the Holy One in Israel, he's on the ground, and the people of Israel know he is God from that point on 
till forever. These are things that cannot be pre-trib or mid-trib. Now knowing that, we're ready to examine how both the nations in Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 38 through 39 can be destroyed by Jesus at his return and yet be separate events. This is the greatest mystery of the end times until one realizes that there is a one year period from the time Jesus returns on the clouds until he completely destroys them at Armageddon. Now, if you aren't a regular viewer of this channel, I am sure you are in shock. But the Bible is clear that the length of the wrath of God, when Jesus takes vengeance on the nations round about that he has promised to destroy, is one year, not a single day or a couple of days. This video explains that theory in great detail. Click on the banner to learn more about it if you haven't already watched it. But this is too important an idea not to discuss in this video as well. Let's look at a couple verses regarding Edom. One of the nations that we have seen is in Psalm 83. My sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom and upon the people whom I have devoted to destruction. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its streams will be turned into pitch and its loose earth into brimstone. So in this passage, we see God has a day when his fire and brimstone is poured out, but this period of retribution or payback lasts an entire year. Here is another verse about Edom. And we saw it previously. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? The one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That is Jesus, of course. Why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. Again, we see Jesus taking vengeance on Edom, and again, we see the day of vengeance starts on a single day, but lasts an entire year. And notice, this is where Jesus first stains his robes. In Revelation 19, we see that Jesus' robes are already stained when he mounts the white horse to leave heaven and return to fight Armageddon. So Jesus returns on the clouds, pours out his recompense on Edom and the other nations round about. This is where he stains his robes. And then he returns to heaven, gathers the army of his saints who were raptured and then together, they return to the earth to fight Armageddon. They are two separate events separated by a year's time, just as scripture says. Of course, scripture has other references to this year's period. Daniel's 70th week itself is a sabbatical cycle of years. In Hebrew, it's called a Shabuah. The final year of every sabbatical cycle is different from the other six years. It is the Sabbath year or the Shemitah year. You may have heard of this. The 70th week is no different. The final year is set aside and different from the others. And that is the year God poured out his wrath on the nations round about. Also in Genesis, the flood was a picture of God's wrath that would eventually come. Peter confirms this in 2 Peter 3. And the flood, <laughs> it lasted a year. In Deuteronomy, God prescribed the length of time a husband has to wait after marrying his wife before he could go to war. And that time was one year. 
The Bible is full of verses and parables that clearly show that the wrath of God is a year long. If you are still struggling with this idea and understanding, we, we realize that it's a new concept and we refer you back to that earlier video where we explain this in significantly more depth. Then return here because we're about to apply it. Where is fire and brimstone mentioned in the book of Revelation? It's mentioned in the first and sixth trumpet judgments where one third of the grass and trees are burned and then a third of the human population of the earth is killed. And I am proposing that the nations round about in Psalm 83, the inner core nations, those that attack Israel in that Psalm are burned in the fire and brimstone of those judgments. Well, two thirds of the earth would include the other nations, the outer ring nations, and they are not burned in the initial fire and brimstone. That is why the nations in Psalm 83 do not appear in Ezekiel 38 and 39's list of nations. They are no longer existing by the time the battle of Armageddon is fought. They were destroyed by the fire and brimstone a year earlier than Armageddon. Now I believe those 10 nations in Psalm 83 invade Israel along with the nations in the outer ring listed in Ezekiel 38-39 at the midpoint of the tribulation period. Ezekiel 38 contains a general statement about other nations being included. Gomer with all its troops, Beth to Gorma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. These many peoples likely include the Psalm 83 nations, but they are not there at the end. And that is why, in my opinion, Ezekiel is not showing these nations specifically and why he doesn't list them. When are they destroyed in the scheme of Ezekiel 38-39 then? That point is also clearly and definitively given in Ezekiel 38. I will call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and with blood I will enter judgment with him, and I will rain on him and his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. This passage is clearly the day of the Lord, the day Jesus returns on the clouds one year prior to Armageddon. Notice the mention of the sword. This is the same sword we saw in Isaiah 34 where we learned it was a day of vengeance and a year of recompense. And that's the sword that punishes Edom. This passage also includes a statement that every man's sword will be against his brother. This is a reference to Gideon's defeat of the Midianites in Judges that we looked at earlier, again referring to the destruction of the inner circle of nations. When they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord set his sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army. And the statement of blood, hail, and fire in Ezekiel 38 is almost identical to what Revelation tells us about the first trumpet. The first sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Many have guessed that Ezekiel 38 and 39 almost seem like two separate battles, and they are. The first one, pictured in the end of Ezekiel 38, is the day of the Lord, after the sixth seal, when Jesus comes on the clouds and fire and brimstone is poured out on a third of the earth. This burns up the nations of Psalm 83, but the outer ring of nations still exist, and they are subjected to the rest of God's wrath and their armies are finally destroyed at Armageddon a year later, which is Ezekiel 39. Trying to compress the return of Jesus and Armageddon into a single day is, in my opinion, one of the great misunderstanding of all of eschatology. If you want even more evidence that these are separate events, please watch this video when the banner appears. Now, in our next video, we'll take a look at the Dead Sea Scrolls.
and in our first episode, the most unusual scroll, the Copper Scroll, which is likely a treasure map to where the temple treasures are buried, waiting for the Messiah to dig them up. If you want to keep watching, well, click right here. If it isn't published yet, another appropriate video will appear until it is. This is Nelson, and I'll see you there.